All right. All right, so again, um, this is do additional documentation requests and denials. I'm Brad Myers, I'm the Director of Compliance and Clinical Services for Carolina Therapy Services and Trinity Rehab. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I, am, I help your clinical specialists and your area directors and Kim and Jamie with program development, documentation reviews, you know, just overall compliance. But one of the big things that I do for both companies is assisting with documentation requests and I appeal any denial that involves therapy. So we have some facilities that have been with me for almost 20 years. I have some facilities that haven't been with me for all that long. So if you have been with me for a long time, hi, it's good to see you guys. If you're new, welcome, it's nice to meet you. Um, it's, hopefully this is not the first time you guys um, are hearing this information or are seeing these forms that I'm gonna talk about, but um, it's very important information. So please make sure if you have questions, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, if you don't do it on this call, please reach out to me afterwards or when I'm in the facilities and let's talk about it. All right. So for the agenda, we're gonna talk about current ADRs, why you're getting them. Um, because that is becoming more, more of an issue in several facilities and clinics. When you get an ADR, what you need to do about it. And that's a little bit of a different process between Med A and Med A like. When I talk about, for these purposes, when I talk about Med A, I'm talking about anything that's short term rehab, Med, traditional A, Navi Health, Humana, UHC, anything that's short term. And then Med B is your traditional B, your UHC B, um, Optum B anything like that, even straight Medicaid, stuff like that. Unfortunately, if you have denials, what do we do when that happens? Um, common reasons that we're getting denials right now, and then specifically current PDPM, PDPM issues, because that is becoming more and more of an issue right now. So what is the documentation request? First of all, um, and that should be the first bullet point, an ADR is not a denial. It's not unusual, even in this day and time, for, to, for me to hear from a facility that they have gotten a denial or they've gotten all of these denials. And when they send it to me, it's not a denial. It's just the payer that is looking for additional documentation in order to substantiate the services that we have provided. Um, please uh, make sure you meet in your line, please, if you're just come, getting on. Obviously, First things first, we have to respond to it in some way in order to just justify payment. We cannot just ignore those. Um, the ADR that you get can either be a prepayment review. So you submitted the claim and before they pay you, they are going to want the documentation to justify whatever you've sent. Or it could be a post payment review, meaning they've already paid you and they want the documentation to prove it retroactively. We got we usually have 30 45 days to respond to the ADRs. Um, and that's all over the place. I've seen some ADRs that allow more than 45 days. And unfortunately, I have seen some, as some of you medical records people and business office managers and facility people know, some of these they're sending to us are pretty much a quick turnaround time. They're not even giving us 30 days. Um, and I, again, if there's no response to the claim, it's fully denied. You'll usually get a letter in the mail alerting of the ADR, um, but sometimes your business office manager can see that the claim has been triggered for a review in FIS. So you may even know that the documentation request is coming before you even get anything in the mail. So it's very important that the facility staff um, monitor the mail often to make sure ADR responses are begun timely. So why are you getting ADRs right now? Um, your business, your billing practices are out of the ordinary. Notice I'm not saying in right there that you're doing anything wrong. It's just that you're out of the ordinary. All facilities are not created equal. All clinics are not created equal. You may be billing more of a certain CPT code or a certain HIPS code than what your payer would expect. There's nothing wrong with it if that is the makeup of your patient population and you have supporting documentation. Uh, versus if you have suspicious billing practices, if you know you're applying KX to all claims, for example, if you're applying 59 to all payers, that doesn't seem right. And if we do that, that, that's opening up, us up for a review. 
any new provider is probably going to be at risk for a, a certain kind of ADR called a TPE audit. And I do know that we have facilities that are under that right now. And if you are, you know the excitement and the fun that that entails. Um, CERT, Comprehensive Error Rate Testing, is a random review that Medicare and Palmetto GBA and your whatever MAC you have, have had going on for quite a while. So we'll talk about that in more specific detail in a minute. Seems like UHC, Aetna, Humana, all these replacement claims, it seems like they review sometimes every single one of their patients that you have come through, that they have come through your building. And uh, I don't, sometimes I don't think that that's an exaggeration. So expect those, if you're taking those uh, Med A replacements, you could have a legal request from an attorney. Most of the time, knock on wood, that is not the result of something that happened in your facility or something that therapy or nursing did. It's something that happened before, you know, the, the car accident or the slip and fall at Walmart that warranted the qualifying hospital stay that put them in your facility, but we still have to submit documentation in response to those. The beneficiary or the POA could submit a request um, for documentation. Or the ADR could just be completely random. You know, the payer is casting a net and they don't have anything better to do. So they're, they've decided that they're just going to pick on your facility and see if they can find anything. But if they do find anything with ADR, you can expect more documentation requests to come. So urgent. This is one of the big changes that I want to talk about on this PowerPoint. Um, every nursing facility on this call could expect this. this is the big reason that I wanted to have this call now. Medicare has um, demanded that all of the MACs in the country, which is Palmetto GBA for most of you, um, we have Neridian for some facilities, we have a scattering of other MACs, but most of you are Palmetto GBA, but every MAC, regardless of who you use, um, CMS has mandated that they all send, um, that they all send at least five documentation request to every skilled nursing facility in their jurisdiction. And what they're looking for is supporting PDPM groupers. Now this is, this link here is the McKnight's article that goes all in detail about it. I uh, don't know that you can click on this, but again, I'm gonna send out a copy of this PowerPoint. So um, you can also Google this, or if you um, are a McKnight's subscriber, you may have already read this or Google this or however you need to find this, um, every skilled nursing facility needs to be aware of this because these requests could have started on June 5th. And for you guys that are Johnny on the spot, you know that it's June 8th. So these may be in your mailbox right now. So what they're looking for, again, every skilled nurse facility, and this is copy pasted from the um, <clears throat> McKnight's article. Every skilled nursing facility in the U.S. will be subject to a five-claim audit starting the week of June 5th, a.k.a. now, as regulators try to better assess and root out improper payments. Now, whenever Medicare talks about an improper payment, we always think about um, they're overpaying us, but it is possible that they could have underpaid us also. Um, I don't know that I've ever heard of that, but it is a possibility. Um, I'm glad that all of you guys are muted right now so I can't hear the laughter um, about Medicare saying that they have underpaid us and they send us more money, but it is in theory a unicorn possibility. So the max in every region are required to pull five Med A claims from every facility they cover and review them for potential errors. The results, will lead to basic education, all right, it's in red, adjustment to prepayment claims, i.e. they're going to deny the claim before it's even paid, and more in-depth one-on-one education for providers who have errors on more than one-fifth. So of these five claims, you can fail one of them. If you fail two, that's going to warrant further investigation. The effort follows the Health and Human Services report that found skilled nursing facilities had the highest rate of improper payments with nearly a quarter of those tied to what therapy is documenting, what nursing is documenting, billing errors, none of the above. What, they, what the quarter of the errors were tied to was insufficient documentation. So the documentation was there, it just was not sent with the documentation request. So if you get one of these um, documentation requests, um, and you know it's a good rule of thumb to send the same thing for any of the short-term PDPM payers, but what are what do we need to be doing in the facilities 
now or what we need to have been doing and what we definitely need to be sending with these requests specifically with this audit coming that's going on right now support of your admission diagnosis what was that person just in the hospital for gg assessments that are signed by the clinicians hear my voice if your gg assessments be they therapy be they nursing be they mds if they are not signed they will not be accepted um, they want to see and, and and remember the admission diagnosis and the GGs are affecting your PT, your OT, your speech groupers, um, your nurses, um, your nursing grouper, the BIMS. You have to have supporting documentation. If you say that there is a cognitive deficit, you better have a BIMS to support that. Um, that's affecting your speech grouper. All of the list of speech comorbidities, especially if speech has assigned a diagnosis of late effects of CVA. So yes, this person has dysphagia, but they don't just have dysphagia because they were extubated at the hospital. They have dysphagia because of the CVA that happened two years ago. That has to be documented somewhere. You cannot just assume that Palmetto is going to know that person. You have to have documented support of that swallowing disorder. You have to have documented um, supporting documentation for the altered diet. And an altered diet is not heart healthy um vegan anything like that it is an altered diet in or or di altered liquids in response to a swallowing disorder and then you have to have supporting documentation for all of your ntas so what to send with an adr or i, I say with a med a or i say humana but really any of these you know navi health blue cross blue shields anything that is a short-term rehab adr what do you send with it? Well, first of all, you send back the ADR request. Sometimes they'll actually have a, uh, the little code that you have to scan and you have to put it right on top so they know that they have sent it to you. You have to remind them. You have to send the UBO4 billing form with the HIPS codes. You have to send the hospital information, at least the discharge summary that says what the diagnosis was. It has some information about orders, blah, 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 blah. But if you have histories and physicals, and if you have consults from neurology, ortho, things like that, anything that happened at the hospital is going to support this claim, you need to send it. If admission info, uh, specifically the nursing assessments, the fall assessments, assessments from dietary, social work, your SNF certification statement, um, that is a big deal that I'm going to go into more detail in on a future slide. All of your orders, especially your admit to skilled med A order. And this used to be controversial. I used to have facilities that would argue that this is necessary, but I assure you that it is. And the reason that I know that is because we've learned from experience. You know, if we did not have a uh, med A admit to skilled order that was, you know, met the requirements that Medicare wanted, they would, you know, disallow it. So make sure you have that. Your, all of your therapy um, documentation, including the service logs. We're going to talk about that in more uh, detailed, uh, more detail in a few minutes. Uh, all of the rest of your documentation, not just therapy and nursing, all of your MDS assessments. For, for right now, your ADL flow sheets, if this is a um, like a CMA, a, a CMI review. Uh, your signature log, if you have physicians that are still doing manual signatures on anything and their signatures are illegible, and they probably are, you have to have a physician signature log so CMS knows that that illegible signature belongs to Dr. Smith. And then um, a physician's this thing is on my screen. I don't know if you guys can see it, but um, I think that that's the physician signature log. So whatever you send with the, the med a and humana adr obviously they must support now you know we haven't talked about rugs in a long time uh you guys that are new to SNFs, you may not even know what a med a rug is but we we do on occasion it's getting fewer and far between but we have had adrs for way back in rug days if you can believe that so if that's the case we have to know what documentation to su submit with that but more likely than not, you're getting a PDPM um, audit, an audit that happened from when we switch, transitioned to PDPM. So you have to submit anything that substantiates those PDPM groupers, which is what I talked about on the previous slides, for the requested dates. It is extremely important that these reviews be handled by staff who understand 
rubs or more likely PDPM systems to make sure that appropriate documentation is sent to cover all of the review dates. And I cannot stress the importance of that enough. We're going to talk about examples on, on the next slide. Usually you're going to have to send documentation and assessments that occurred before or after the requested dates. So what am I talking about? So you get a, an ADR in your facility and the, and the ADR is for January through uh, January, March 1st through March 20th of 2020. But those are days 20 through 39 of their Med A stay. So you also, even though the ADR was just for March, if you just send March documentation, this claim is going to be denied. That is not when the PDPM groupers were established. They were established in February. So you have to send the documentation for February. <clears throat> You must send the five day assessment that was completed in February and the discharge assessment that was completed in March. If only March documentation and assessments were sent, groupers established on the five day MDS, again, which was completed in February, will not be supported. The reverse is also true. So we have this um, documentation request that is for March 1st of 2020 through March 31st of 2020. The groupers were established on the five-day MDS, they always are, but the patient was discharged on 41020. April documentation and discharge assessments must also be submitted because according to Medicare, you could have done an IPA or something else could have happened on April 1st. So even though you, the, the take home message for Med A and Humana is that we need to send the entire documentation packet for that stay. We cannot just send the documentation for the dates of services that are requested. I had talked about a CERT ADR um, on one of the first slides, and that is comprehensive error rate testing. They come in a special envelope and everything. I think it has CERT written all over it. And what Medicare is looking for there is determining improper payments. When I go into facilities and I talk to therapists and I say there's more eyes on your documentation than ever, this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So in a CERT review, the CERT contractor checks to see that providers are billing correctly and, and contractors are paying correctly. There again, they could be overpaying you or underpaying you. I'll pause for you to laugh. They select and review claims, assign improper payment categories, calculate improper payment rates, and provide education to change behaviors. That is what a CERT is for. You must respond within 75 days, so at least they give you plenty of time to get the chart together. But it's very important for you guys to know, your medical records people, your business office, whoever is checking the mail, it's very important for you guys to know what a CERT letter looks like if you've never seen one. Um, issues with the CERT review, or not replying could lead to further audit requests. So if you submit documentation to them that they do not like or is insufficient or whatever, and you fail that cert, then they're gonna send two requests and then they're gonna send four. And then it's just gonna snowball from there. Um, Palmetto, if you, especially if Palmetto is your Mac, they have a lot of information about um, cert reviews. I'm sure CMS does too. Uh, if you're one of the facilities that does not have Palmetto, your Mac probably has information about a CERT. So if you want more information about it, that's a whole nother talk, but you can Google um, Palmetto GBA CERT or CMS CERT or CERT review or whatever. Any questions about Med A ADRs or denials before I go on to Med B? Med B happens a little bit differently. So I hesitate to even say this uh, because I don't want to jinx us all, but it's very unusual to get a Med B ADR. Most of the documentation requests that we get are for Med A, Navi Health, UHC, hum you know, short-term rehab sorts of things. But we have had some facilities that get Med B ADR, so it's not unheard of. Um, but how we're going to respond to these ADRs, what we're going to send is going to be a little bit different with the MedB ADRs. Remember, MedB is not paying for your room and board and your nursing and your dietary. MedB is paying for your therapy and maybe some of your physician services. So that is what we're trying to justify. So it's a lot less documentation than the MedA short-term rehab crowd. So we're going to send, again, a copy of the ADR to remind them that they're the ones that sent it to us. You're going to submit a copy of the UBO4. 
the therapy eval and treatment orders, um, very important, or your standing orders. If you're a skilled nursing facility and you have standing orders that have PT, OT, speech, eval, um, and it's signed by the doctor of that that pay, that resident, that's fine too, that, that'll work. But I, I love to have a, a more recent therapy eval order if it's there. The therapy plan of care signed and dated by the physician or the non-physician practitioner within 30 days. Non-physician practitioners can sign med B therapy documentation. We'll talk about that in more detail in a few minutes. Therapy, if the patient's on caseload long enough that they need an updated therapy plan of care or a research, it also has to be signed by the physician or the MPP within 30 days. The daily notes, the progress notes, the service logs and record of treatment. And if for whatever reason, there is anything in that documentation uh, of signature that cannot be read, if it's illegible, we would also have to submit a, a signature log. Anything that therapy does, uh, we do electronic signatures on all of our stuff, including usually the physician's signature. So hopefully um, that's not a big deal in most of the locations, but if you do go through that packet, <clears throat> and there is an illegible signature, we would have to submit a signature log. Screen is not advancing. What do we not send? Now, this is where they differ from Med A a little bit. We don't send hospital information with a Med B ADR. Most of the time, there's not any. This is a long-term resident that was referred to us by nursing or restorative or the case mix team that the person hadn't been in the hospital. So if that's the case, obviously there's no hospital information to send. We don't send interdisciplinary documentation like nursing documentation or dietary. We do not send the MDS assessments. Medicare does not care about that for MedB. We do not send ADL flow sheets. We do not send labs or medication. Uh, GG assessments, if we're doing those with MedB, none of that stuff. Um, unless they directly support the therapy services. But we are instructing our therapists and assistants that the, the therapy documentation that they do needs to stand alone. So hopefully I'm not having to go to nursing documentation to support what therapy is doing. As a matter of fact, it's much more likely that nursing or dietary may inadvertently um, contradict the, the the overall picture I'm tr I'm trying to paint of this picture with therapy documentation, so it's not helpful to send any of that information. CMS wants to see that the therapy services build are necessary and skilled. We do a lot of work with our therapy teams about documenting that way. If the services are repetitive or could be safely administered by unlicensed staff, um, by unlicensed I mean not not a therapy license. So if they could be done by CNAs or nurses. Um, Medicare is going to deny that if it's provided by a therapist. Sending documentation for service dates prior to or after the requested dates in the case of Med B could cause CMS to question the services and deny them. So that's a little bit different than what I had said, remember, about the Med A stuff. Sending interdisciplinary documentation for the MDS and stuff that do not support therapy could also lead to a denial. So you see, um, with Med B, we are trying to support the therapy claim. We are not trying to support nursing HIPs or NTAs or anything like that. So we're only going to submit the documentation that they ask for for a Med B or a B replacement. So if you're a medical records person or whoever is responsible for collecting all this sort of stuff and you're frantically writing all this down and trying to remember what therapy documentation you're supposed to be requesting or what you're trying to be pulling out of your, your net health system, I'm about to put your mind at ease. We have a very good system of keeping ADRs from turning into denials. Um, I, I think that the best offense is a good defense. Um, and I would like to make sure that our ADR system is sound. So I don't want to lose sight of that because everybody's looking for denials. We're going to keep an eye out for possible issues that will lead to a denial and solve them at the ADR level. So for example, if we do see that something, that physician signature or whoever signature is illegible, we need to submit that signature log with the ADR. We do not need to wait for, for the entire claim to be denied because of an illegible signature. Um, the delay, if we see that the therapy plans of care or the research are not signed and dated by the physician within 30 days, which is a Medicare requirement, we need to know that. 
and we need to go ahead and submit a delayed certification with the ADR instead of waiting for that claim to be denied um, because of an old cert. So when you do get an ADR, whoever in your facility or, or in your clinic um, is checking the mail and getting them or you're checking FIS and you see them, just make a copy of it and scan it to me, um, depending on which facility, which company you're at. Um, you would either send, email it to me at the Carolina Therapy email or at the Trinity Rehab. And I will forward all of the therapy documentation back that you need. You do not have to, nobody on this call except for me, including therapy managers, nobody needs to be pulling therapy documentation except for me. Um, do not mail the ADRs to me. Just slap them on your scanner and email it to me. Because remember, timeliness, a lot of times, on average, we have about 30 to 45 days to respond. So, but it, even if it's 30 days, you know, they sent it, a week ago, it took you a week to look to find it in the, the mail and for it to, you know, notice that it's an ADR and everything that's going to take a week to get to me right there. That's that's 21 days down. We're not going to have enough time. So don't I'm, I'm, for for ADRs because of the timeliness issue, do not be mailing things to me. Just slap a copy of the the actual request that you've got. Um, on your scanner, email it to me. I'll know what it is, and I'll reply to you with all of the therapy documentation that you need. So I take care of what dates to send, what forms to send, if it's signed, if it's dated, if it needs a delayed cert, all that sort of stuff, and I will get you what you need from therapy standpoint. So the process is you get the ADR in the facility, the, AD, the ADR form is emailed to me, and I will reply back to you with all the therapy documentation. Medical records will collect all of the non-therapy documentation. In the past, I have been asked to do non-therapy documentation, and I we we I'm, we're not doing that. I don't have access. Well, I do have access to some of your systems, but I don't know it like that to be going and finding your nursing documentation and your MDSs and printing them and all that sort of stuff. So. You know, medical records are still going to have a part to play in this because they're going to have to collect all the non-therapy documentation. And then the ADR packets are submitted to the requesting agency by the facility, not by me. Any questions about ADRs before I go on to denials? So for ADRs, all you have to do is let me know that you have an ADR and I'll send you the documentation. Hopefully we send the payer or the requesting agency the documentation. They love what they see and you never hear from them again. But if that's not the case and because of an ADR issue or whatever, this claim results in a denial, that's a little bit more involved of a process. So um, and it, just like with um, ADRs, it's a little bit of a different situation with denials between payers. So I make it easy on you guys. And again, I'm going to send this out in attachments to everybody who um, accepted the Zoom invite. So you'll be getting copies of, of these, but I have a, this is the CTS version, but the Trinity version looks exactly the same. This is a denial registration process that if you get a denial, it's step by step what I need and what you need to send. And then I have a registration form that has a checklist specifically of things. This is the Med A and the Med A replacement form version. So it has, you know, sort of what I talked about earlier with specific things that you need to send. I need all of this information if it is um, applicable. I need it filled in. Like if this is a Medicare claim and you don't know what the document control number is, I ha somebody has to find it because they will not accept the um, request if all of this information is not filled in. Sometimes I'll get this form and just the beneficiary is filled in. That does not help me and I will send it right back to you. Um, there, All of this information up here is um, there for a reason. So I have to know this in order to appeal. This is the Med A version. This is the Med B version. And again, notice this, there's a lot less information that I need for Med B. Med B claims typically, uh, if, if this is a, not a denial, typically all I need is this form. So I know exactly what was denied, why it was denied. 
Um, I need a copy of the billing form. There's probably, I'll probably need a corrected billing form, which I think I talk about on a future slide. I need a copy of those orders. Um, and then pretty much everything else I need, I can pull myself out of net health. So if that's the case, you guys can just email me the documentation that is needed. You don't, you don't need to mail a med bead now for me because it, it may just be like seven pages. But um, again, those forms and the process will be attached to an email that I'm going to send out to you guys after this. Um, we handle all appeals involving therapy. I just had a facility that was trying to get me to send documentation to them so they can appeal their own therapy denial. That's great, but you want me to do it. Um, I have, unfortunately, I have a lot of experience in deny, uh, appealing denials. I know why they're being denied. Um, I've spent a lot of work um, figuring out how to along with partners and talking to, you know, nursing consultants and MDS consultants, how to um, argue denials. Um, so again, refer to the denial registration process and form, which I just talked about, and I'm going to send to you. Please fill out the form completely and include it with the packet. I need all documentation listed on those registration forms. If you do not send me the SNF cert, I will be asking for it. If I'm missing the MDS, the nursing documentation, um, a corrected UB, anything like that, I cannot proceed. And that's going to hold up the, you know, the time that it takes me to get all this packet together. Um, again, if this is Med A or HMOA, please mail the documentation to the address on the forms. Do not scan or email large denials. And the reason for that is... Um, there have been several instances of people, I would prefer, you know, like everything be electronic also, but there have been several instances of people that have emailed me 600 plus page documentation packets that were caught up in your firewall, my firewall, it, for whatever reason, the claim was, the, the file was too big to get to me and it's not reliable. So for right now, until and, and we are CTS and Trinity are in the process of figuring out how to do this system better, right? Like how to get large documentation packets to me so I can uh, and so I can do the appeal. But for now, for large documentation like Med A HMOA, make sure that you are mailing them to me. And again, the ad addresses on all the forms and the process and all that sort of stuff. Please, in the name of God, do not send double-sided and especially stapled copies. That's going to slow me down. Um, the payers will not accept um, appeals in that format. And if you send me double-sided, I've got to uh, transition them to single-sided. And invariably, that piece of information, if page 703 is the most important thing in that packet, invariably that's the one that's going to get missed because I'm transit, I'm changing double-sided to single-sided. So please just send everything single-sided to me and please do not staple things together because that that is a nightmare unstapling things. You also don't have to number pages. Um, I've seen where, you know, the facility has had somebody, I'm assuming the medical records person, go through and write like page one, two, three, four, and every single page has like a, a handwritten number on the bottom of it. Do not do that because I'm going, when I get the packet, I'm going to put it in um, the order that I think it needs to be in. And that may not be the order that you sent it to me in. And then the numbers aren't going to make any sense. So don't, don't do that. <clears throat> and remember to send all appeal decisions to me or notify me if the claim pays in fist. So I'm going to send the appeal but they're probably not going to let me know what the decision is. They're going to send that to the facility, which may uh, arrive at the facility addressed to me. So make sure all of your people, whoever's checking the mail, know who I am. But um, if the claim pays in fists, which is the case with most med B denials, your business office, your AR person is going to have to be keeping an eye on that and letting me know when um, that decision is rendered or the claim pays. So the denial process is that you find out that you have um, received a denial. You get a letter <laughs> or you see that in FIST that the, the services have been denied. The medical records uh, department collects the documentation. I can assist and provide therapy service laws. Again, anything, anything therapy related, you do not have to send to me. I can pull that myself. 
the packet is mailed to me if it's med a or med a replacement the address is at the end of the powerpoint and on the registration forms i'll organize the packet i write a letter of medical necessity and anything else that i have to do if there's a delayed cert if there is a signature log that we need if we need to you know, uh, I don't know, provide any uh, anything that's missing or we need to correct something before the appeal is sent in, I'll get that and, and let you guys know. I submit the appeal packet and I manage the appeal from there. Um, the decisions will usually, again, be sent to the facility addressed to me, so make sure you know who I am. Um, and occasionally the claim may only pay in fists, so notify me as soon as possible of any update to the appeal. I handle uh, appeals all the way through administrative law judge level. Um, I actually have, I think, five at ALJ level right now. Once all levels of appeal have been exhausted, and if the denial is not paid in full, we will indemnify the facility the appropriate cost that the therapy was delivered during that time period. So that's another reason for you guys to be having me do your appeals. If if you do the appeal and you don't win it, if it, we're not going to indemnify you. I have to do the appeal if, if indemnifi indemnification is on the line. It's late on Thursday. Um, if it's allowed by the contract, if the outstanding denial reason is therapy related, so they don't like what therapy documented or, you know, blah, blah, blah. If it's, if it's therapy related, it will be indemnified. And it, uh, it may not be the full therapy invoice, right? Like in, for a med A, they may not deny the entire claim, that, that entire PTOT speech grouper. <clears throat> they may just downcode it from an SD to an SA. In that case, you would just get indemnified the difference. As with ADRs, timeliness is key. Um, but fortunately with denials, because there's a lot more work to be done with them, um, most payers allow you more time to submit an appeal. For Medicare, you have 120 days to submit a, a first level appeal. After that, if you're not su successful, you have 180 days to submit a second level. After that, if you're not successful, you have 60 days to request a hearing for uh, in front of a judge. Um, but I don't mean to put for you guys to see this slide and say that you have 120 days to get something to me because it may take me a minute to get a packet together and make corrections and get your physician to sign whatever and everything. So please do not wait until the last minute. It's very time consuming for me to review documentation and, and write a letter of medical necessity. So as soon as you know that you have a denied claim, and as soon as you can get everything together to me, please get it to me as soon as possible. Um, for med B denials um, specifically, make sure that the UB that is submitted with the appeal is correct. So most of the time, I, I don't know if I talk about med B denials on a future slide, but um, you know, if not, I'll go ahead and hit on a little bit. All of the diagnoses that are assigned by therapy, all the treatment diagnoses have to be on that billing claim. MedB does not pay because of COPD. They do not pay therapy because of a UTI. They pay therapy because of muscle weakness and difficulty walking and dysphagia and diagnoses like that. So if the therapy treatment diagnoses are not on the claim, that is going to, they're going to be denied. And if the deny, if, if the claim is denied for medical necessity for missing diagnoses, it is a full denial of medical necessity that we have to do an appeal on. It's not something that, oh my God, I forgot diagnoses and I'm going to throw them on the claim and resubmit it. They will not allow that. Um, I don't know why. Um, I've argued with Palmetto about that, but they're not listening to me. It's more work for us. It's more work for them, but apparently they like it that way. If it's a KX modifier that's missing or a 59 modifier that's missing, those can be added back to the claim and resubmitted um, without a full redetermination. If we submit a redetermination because of KX modifiers and 59 modifiers, it's a lot of work for all of us. It's a lot of time and it's going to be um, refused by your MAC. So if you send me a denial um, with the RA or the explanation of benefits with the denial reason codes and all that sort of stuff, and it's, a, it's because of a KX or a 59 modifier, I'll let you know, and then you guys can just resubmit the bill. It's very easy when that happens. And, you know, if you're, 
thinking about, you know, well, what do we need to appeal? I say we need to appeal everything. If this is a, you know, just a, an, an evaluation only that they denied, um, if this is just three visits of OT that they've denied it. That may not seem like a big deal to you guys, but I say we need to um, appeal everything. It may be that they've denied something for what you think is a very, or what we all think is a very good reason, but I have done some appeals and I have really thought that my, um, my argument to them was shaky at best. And they and they approved it. So you never you never know what they're going to approve. I mean, if we submit an appeal um, all the way up to you know second level, and the, the, the worst they can say is no. So you know maybe you get somebody that's not really um, knowledgeable about policy, and you submit something to them, and they say you know yes, okay, that's great. But even small denials can go against your denial error rate and put you at risk for more scrutiny. So that's something else that these payers are looking for is how many denials has your facility or your clinic have and just that therapy eval only or just those three OT visits are going to count against that. And so if they're denied, we need to argue with them. So why are we getting uh, commonly right now, why are we getting denials uh, by far in a way? The biggest reason that I, the most appeals that I do is because of what I just talked about with the missing therapy diagnoses. So please, if you don't get anything else from this, this talk, please stop what you're doing and make sure that you have a process of checking the, uh, between billing and therapy of confirming med B treatment diagnoses. It, it, every single treatment diagnoses from all three of those disciplines have to go on that claim. If you put the PT and OT diagnoses up there and not the speech, the speech services service lines are going to be denied. It is, uh, I, I hesitate to say it's an easy appeal, um, but you know it's not like a giant med A appeal, so I guess it's, it's 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 better than that. But it still opens up that claim in your facility and your clinic for increased scrutiny. Once you have a denial because of something innocuous like you know diagnoses not being on the claim, then they are going to go and they're going to read what therapy documented, and they are going to really scrutinize diagnoses and everything. So don't give them that chance. Make sure you guys. If it's the end of triple check where you talked about all of your med A people at the end, you talk about all of your med B diagnoses or the biller gets with the therapy manager and however you are doing it, please make sure you have a process of getting therapy treatment diagnoses on every single med B UBO4. Um, it, again, if the ADR, the appeal was not submitted by the deadline, they will deny that that's going to lead to a denial. And Palmetto GBA is hardcore about it. If the if the deadline decision is January 1st and you submit it at 12.01 a.m. A, uh, on February, you know, or the next day, they're going to deny. They're, they're going to say that you did not meet the deadline. They're not going to accept it. Some of the replacement plans are a little bit more generous, but I would not count on that. Again, just like what we talked about with the current uh, Med A review, all documentation per review date is not submitted. If, if, if we don't submit all documentation, you can't assume that they have it. We have to submit everything. Therapy service logs not submitted. That's going to, uh, we can take care of that right now. If again, if you submit all of your ADRs to me and I send you the therapy documentation that you need. Uh, ADL flow sheets not submitted. If this is a rug or a CMI, CMI denial, and you know uh, the ADL flow sheets in Section G are about to go away, so hopefully on future talks we're not going to talk about that. But for right now, they're important. Again, a missing sniff admit order, missing incomplete cert or research. Med A orders are not uh, well. Med A orders or certs are signed by a non-physician practitioner. We just had a facility where this happened, where a uh, we can't remember if it was a PA or a nurse practitioner signed med A orders and admission orders and certs, and that is not allowed. It has to be a physician. Again, we've had denials over that. MPPs can sign med B therapy documentation, but they cannot sign med a lot of med A stuff. So you need to get in the habit of physicians signing everything for med A, or like I said, GG is not supported. Um, I'm going to hit the, the certain research real quick. Um, it, it's very important that that's, that certification statement and that, that recertification statement are 
done completely timely. If anything, if, if, if all of the I's are not dotted and the T's are crossed on that form, it will be denied. So when I sent out this um, PowerPoint, all, all these slides, make sure that you go to this and everybody is aware of what a SNF cert statement, what, what a requirement is because Medicare has issued this article with a lot of details about what they're expecting. And if we don't live up to that, it's gonna be, they're gonna deny the entire claim, not just downcode it. Current PDPM denial issues, no evidence that GGs were completed timely. GGs established by therapy do not match GGs recorded on the MDS. This leads to a complete denial of the full claim or a, or a downcode of individual groupers. So real quick, what are GGs? They are established by the interdisciplinary team and, res, and represent the typical performance of the resident in the first three days of the stay before the benefit of therapy. And that is very important. GGs need to be discussed by the IDT, interdisciplinary team, by day three with documentation to prove it. Uh, you can use um, the one of the forms I'm about to show you to prove that these meetings are occurring and submit with the ADR or the appeal. You can complete section GG on, on the MDS and sign it on day three, but do not rely on therapy GG assessments alone. This, this is just a couple of examples. MedPass has a tool that I know that some facilities used to be using that um, if you're interested in GG authentication, you can Google GG MedPass, I'm assuming, and find that if you've never seen this. Um, Briggs Healthcare has another one that you could be using. Um, but what we are, the easiest thing that we're asking um, people to do is on this slide. GG scoring not supported by clinical documentation. So what we're asking, um, our therapy managers and the MDS coordinators or what we're suggesting you guys do is when that admission assessment is done and those GGs are established, that you write some kind of statement that says something to this effect. Admission GGs calculated through IDT collaboration based on the resident's typical performance in the first three days of the stay and before the benefit of therapy. And then that's signed by MDS and your therapy manager and your nurses and whoever else is, is signing that MDS. You're going to ensure that therapy and nursing documentation match and support the established groupers, but it's, it's not unusual for the therapy GGs to be different than what actually makes it onto the MDS. This note is going to resolve, resolve you from that and it's gonna take care of the previous issue that you don't have any signed GG assessments. If your speech therapy groupers are not supported, we've already talked about CBA late effects or supporting documentation for dysphagia and altered diet, supporting um, documentation for uh, diagnoses and things like that, that your speech therapist is, are assigning. If you say, for example, that, um, it, or if your speech therapist comes in, and they say that this is a, a resident with a previous CBA, um, that's gonna increase the speech therapy grouper. Active hemiplegia includes, in, increases, it, it can increase the speech grouper, it can increase the nursing grouper, in some cases it, it can increase the PT, OT grouper. So it's very important. So if you have these two bullet points right here in documentation, but somewhere on this claim, you have certainly as a reason for admission, but if you have it even in the comorbidities or the history uh, resolved or without residual deficits diagnosis, that is going to completely wipe out all of the documentation of that CBA and that hemiplegia that you had. So, you know, you again, you have speech therapy saying that they're treating um, dysphagia late effects of CBA and PT, OT, and nursing saying that the person has hemiplegia that is requiring our services. And then somebody assigns Z8673, which is personal history without residual deficits, there went your entire claim because of that diagnosis. <clears throat> um, we do a lot of work. I'm getting short on time here, so I'm just going to fly through a couple of these. We um, This is more us um, communicating with speech therapist with diagnoses and making sure the appropriate diagnoses make it onto the claim. Like if we are, if the speech therapist is evaluating for late effects of dysphagia and which would, which would improve the speech grouper, 
But during the evaluation, we find out that there is no diagnosis, there is no late effects of dysphagia. It has to be on the evaluation. We have to leave it up there because that's what we evaluate, that's what we evaluated for. But speech therapy, therapy manager needs to let the MDS coordinator know or whoever is putting those diagnoses on that MDS for configuring of the groupers, that that is not a diagnosis to be used to configure groupers, if that makes sense. That is an example of all that. So I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, since y'all sat through 55 minutes of that, I wanted to give y'all a cute cat. Um, I know that I had... Uh, yes, we usually number the pages prior to sending. Would you like for us to stop that process? Yes, please. Um, it's not, I mean, it's not terrible, but it's just your medic, your whoever's doing it is spending a lot of time doing it for it, maybe for no reason. I have got, and that's another thing. Whenever we're sending documentation for an ADR or a denial, it, especially these bigger charts, it needs to follow a timeline. Like the first part of it needs to be your billing forms. And then the second part of it needs to be uh, for example, your your hospital documentation, and then your orders, and then your admission assessments, and then your what your Mars and your Tars and your MDS. That you know, I've I've gotten big charts that it looked like you know people threw it up in the air and collected it, and there's no rhyme or reason to it, and it's just very disorganized, and I can't make it out. And and I'm you know I I know what I'm talking about with with SNF stuff. If you send that same documentation package to somebody who does not know what they're talking about, if, if if they can't make it as easy as possible on them, you know, in an ADR, make sure it follows some kind of organized you know process, i.e. you know time limit from admission to discharge or for hospital to SNF to discharge. But um, if you send it to me and I think that the I don't know, the the dietary information is more important. I'm going to move it from where you had it in the packet up further, you know, up in the appeal packet. So. Any other questions? Yes, Anything Brad, else? I have a question. OK. On the uh, statement that you have, we usually take that statement or something similar to that and paste it in an MDS note, but then only MDS is signing that note. Would it be feasible to take that statement and print labels with that statement on it? attach that statement to the GG sheet and have all the disciplinary, the members of the disciplinary team sign it? I think it may be actually okay if it's just MDS. Now that I think about it, I mean, they're looking for a signature. If they, and if you're, if you're, you, you have, so one of the big complaints that we have with net health, if I may get on my soapbox, is that we have, we can provide y'all a GG report with the, the GGs that, that PT and OT came up with but it does not have an electronic signature. Um, and we have been asking NetHealth for, when I say years, I'm not exaggerating. And so have their other customers put an electronic signature on that because that would have right there resolved a lot of this. Um, they're working on it. It's supposed to be done, you know, as with probably what your EMRs, what you guys get to, you know, oh, it's gonna be in the future. So it, it should be happening anytime now, hopefully. But at the very least, we can have the therapist manually sign that GG report. And then you have your CNAs or your nurses or whoever that are also doing the GGs. And if it's in AHT or PCC or wh whatever system that you're using, they're also signed. As long as they're all matched, that's probably okay. But what I typically see is that you got a GG assessment done by therapy that's not, not signed. Then you have nursing GGs that don't match what therapy did and they may also not be signed and then Medicare is saying well how did how did that get onto the the MDS so if you have an MDS statement even if it's only signed by the MDS coordinator that hey this was these these scores were established based on you know blah 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 that statement that may suffice, but any anything, and I think that it's going to be because we have tons of different customers up here, tons of different EMRs, right. and I don't know how 
what what would maybe work for one would not work for the other but if there is some kind of way to get everybody to sign it that would be great um because they're already all okay. you know all signing the the mds but um right. it, at the very least if the if the statement is there and the mds coordinator is signing it i'm i'm happy with that and i just off the top of my head thinking about that i think that that would have absolved the denial issues that we have had involving great. ggs Thanks, Brad. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? You guys can either unmute or send in chat, or you can. So, this is my cell. You can call. I'm a big texter, I love text. You can email me, um, you know, whichever company you're with. Um, it's Sometimes if you are Trinity and you send it to Carolina Therapy or vice versa, it, it gets lost in the shuffle. So please, if you're a Trinity building, please try to stick with the Trinity um, email. If you're CTS, please try to stick with the CTS. This is my address if you have to mail anything to me. But again, um, I'm revamping that process. So hopefully we're going to be able to get away from mailing things to me. This is me. Um, if you never met me, um, and you see me walking around your facility or walking up to your administrator office or something, that is me. I am supposed to be there. So, or if you have seen me and you wondered who I was, that's me. Any other questions or comments or anything? All right. So again, I appreciate everybody's time. Um, I am going to work on getting i was able to record this so i will work on how to get that out to people uh expect another email from me with the powerpoint slides the forms that i discussed and hopefully um at some point some kind of way to get a recording of this i have a chat all right well, thank you guys. Thanks. I appreciate everybody getting on. And if you have any questions, just let me know and good luck with all of your documentation requests. Thank you.